Tom is going to take the lead from here. All okay. right. So Tom, all the way from Florida, Tom, let's not yeah, be sorry. jealous. I, I do want to apologize for the blurriness on the screen. I'm on, on the, uh, um, the uh, balcony overlooking the North River here in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So beautiful day here. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this session. Um, actually, one of my uh, favorite sessions that I'm participating in this week uh, virtually. Um, the transformational impact of reentry courts. I have had the opportunity and the pleasure of being a volunteer attorney and, and now kind of coordinating the volunteer attorneys for our very own reentry docket that we have our, at our Toledo Municipal Court. Uh, reentry courts play a huge role in, in removing obstacles and just uh, offering extra um, handholding, uh, connection of mentors, uh, and, and things like that as people um, exit incarceration, especially. Uh, felony convictions where you're coming out of ODRC. Um, so the, the courts are very important. The, the, the driver of these courts are really the, the, the mentors that participated in them. The attorneys and the judges were just part of the system and, and, and the, the mentors make it happen. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. Just to give you an outline, we'll have 20 minutes for uh, to, uh, Judge Kuhlman and, and uh, Mike Hampton, and we'll have 20 minutes for Judge Russo and Mr. Norton. At the end, we'll have 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers, and Diane Bricker from um, uh, our association will, will handle coordinating, getting the questions to the panelists and, and answered. Um, I do wanna thank our partners, the Western uh, West Conference of the Ohio, um, Ohio Methodist Church, United Methodist Church, sorry, uh, has been phenomenal in this last year in helping coordinate activities, trainings, um, and the Office of Reentry at ODRC, phenomenal partners um, in assisting our local communities. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to introducing our speakers, Judge Tim Kuhlman uh, from the Toledo Municipal Court, which handles misdemeanors and traffic cases here in Toledo, Lucas County, Ohio. He was born and raised in Arlington, Ohio, graduated from Hillsdale College in Michigan in 1988, and graduated the University of Toledo Law School and joined the Ohio Bar in 1991. After graduation, he was an associate at Eastman and Smith, a, a respected law firm in Toledo, where he practiced for 14 years, trying many jury trials and handling more than 20 um, important app appellate cases. In February of 2005, uh, Tim Kuhlman became Judge Kuhlman as he joined the Toledo Municipal Court and has served as presiding administrative judge from 2007 to 2010. He's been our reentry court docket judge since its inception, and I'm very uh, honored to work with him. Our, our mentor with the uh, court is Mike Hampton. He has he was actually on the docket 10 years ago, uh, coming out of incarceration, and he has been helpful to many, 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 many individuals in getting their license, driver's license, removing obstacles, and he'll t share some of those stories with you. The court in Lucas County is just a docket. It's not a specialized court uh, through the Supreme Court like Judge uh, Russell's docket. Um, so I just wanna make that clarification. Our, our next panelist will be Judge Russell from the Cuyahoga Common Pleas Court, which handles felony cases. She, has, uh, she was admitted to the bar in 1982, uh, went to mentor uh, high school and graduated uh, uh, Cleveland Marshall College of Law um, and has been on the Common Pleas bench since 1997. She runs the reentry uh, di our reentry court uh, of the Cuyahoga Common Pleas Court, which works with uh, individuals, uh, I, I believe, coming out of incarceration um, and, and not pretrial. Um, Judge, I'll let you explain a little bit more of that when it's your turn, and uh, I'll have you introduce your speaker. I don't have anything on Mr. Norton. I, I'm sure there's a great story there. So I'm going to start off with uh, having Judge Kuhlman and uh, Mike Hampton begin their uh, uh, presentation. And we're, we are recording just so everybody knows. Okay, thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. I'm gonna start with uh, talking about some of the technical aspects of this. And then um, uh, as a practical matter, how we run our docket, when we do it and who gets on it. And then I'm going to have Mike Hampton talk about um, what it looks like um, from outside the courthouse, say a view from the street, uh, people who need our help and how that works. So um, Judge Russo runs a specialized docket, which she can talk about, but that does require some very specific um, 
I would describe it as monumental requirements from the uh, Ohio Supreme Court to uh, establish yourself as a specialized docket. We do have one of those in the Toledo Municipal Court. It's a specialized veterans docket. It took us a year and a half to get that approved. And it's something like a 75 point uh, set of requirements to get that done. If uh, I, I'm sorry, if I could just interject, I am not a specialized docket under the Supreme Court. Oh, okay. All right, well, thanks for okay. clarifying. No, that. I just want to clear that up. Thanks. Neither are we. So I, I did want to say okay. how we how we uh, do what we do. So in uh, Toledo, under our local rules, uh, we have uh, rule three, which allows for a duties judge. And that allows the duties judge uh, to handle matters uh, that are actually assigned to other judges. The Ohio Supreme Court requires random assignment of cases. And so we have essentially a computer operated lottery system when somebody comes into our court and they get randomly assigned so that uh, all cases are assigned evenly to different judges and judges don't get to pick and choose uh, their defendants or victims or, or however uh, that would happen. It's a matter of fairness. And so it's it would be improper for me to just go around the courthouse and pick cases that I want to handle because my friend Mike Hampton wants me to, okay? So what we can do though, is follow our duties rules um, to be able to bring certain cases on the docket. Um, some of those limitations um, limit us uh, many times to post disposition cases. So they're cases where there's fines and costs or maybe jail days or other things like that. Um, so we can't just go around and take whatever cases that we want. So as a practical matter, what we do is in Toledo, we have a program called First Wednesday or Going Home to Stay on the very first Wednesday of the month. It's difficult with coronavirus because we're trying to do it on Zoom, but before coronavirus, we had everybody in town who was interested in helping returning citizens and all returning citizens and their family were invited to one government center at 11 o'clock. One government center is where our county commissioners are and uh, the county offices, state offices, city offices. It's a huge building. It's probably 25 stories tall with a huge lobby on the first floor. And we take it over. We pack that place. We take over the commissioner's conference room, the city council chambers, uh, there's two or three different um, uh, uh, conference rooms that we take over and the lobby space. We pack the place with people who are willing to help uh, returning citizens. So we have housing, alcohol, drug, mental health, uh, employers, unions who are offering internships and training programs. Uh, housing is there. Um, the, um, the, what, what is our... Uh, our community college. Owens Community College is there uh, for educational opportunities. Uh, so everybody who can provide assistance is there. And um, we have a lot of peer mentors um, who are there. A lot of people from the reentry coalition. Lisa Wilson, who's on the call here, is there representing Lutheran Social Services. But also there are volunteer attorneys who can help people with uh, existing court problems. So we find, I don't know if other communities have done better than we have, and we do better than we used to, but we don't do a great job of cleaning up people's messes when we send them to prison. And then when people get out of prison, they still have that mess. Because your mic is um, a little crackly again. I have no idea what to do about that. <laughs> Is it working by the time? No. Or is it not? No. Um, that's why I was on for 15 minutes before this, so that this thing would work. Um, there, you me, there you go. That works now? It sounds good now. I didn't do anything. Uh, okay. All right. So... Um, we have these volunteer attorneys meet with people. And what happens is when people go to prison, we have warrants for their arrest. We have outstanding fines and costs, all kinds of messes that we have for people. And they're waiting there when they come back. And uh, Karen, Karen uh, McConnell uh, explained this one time. She said, when people are serious about returning and being successful the second time, and they come out and they have this plan in place. You know, Mike Hampton always says, I like a man with a plan. They come out, this is how I'm going to do it. I've got my housing set up. I've got drug, alcohol, mental health. 
off. I got a job. And then as soon as they come back to town, we go bam and serve them with a warrant and take them back to the county jail and bring them to Toledo Municipal Court. Or they go to try to get their license and we say you owe $2,500 in outstanding fines and costs so they can't get a license to get to the job that they're going to use us to pay the $2,500. And so we need to figure these things out. And so these volunteer attorneys meet with people and run their record. That's the first thing. Run their record. Make sure. Now, I know reentry is trying to do this while people are still in prison. And we try to do that before they get out. Uh, but this is another place to catch that. So they sit down with volunteer attorneys, they find out what's on the record, and then they schedule these people for, that's on the first Wednesday of the month. On the third Thursday of the month, we have our reentry docket and people get placed onto that reentry docket and all of their Toledo Municipal Court mess. The whole lifetime of creating this mess is sitting on my bench in one time, one place with a lawyer representing them and Mike Hampton or... Uh, Lisa Wilson or, or, or Willie Knighton or somebody who's a mentor for them, helping them, and we can address it all at one time. Now, I may just be able to just make it go away and say, look, based on what's here, I can do credit time served for the three years you just did in prison or the 10 years you just did in prison, suspend all your fines and costs, suspend any probation period that existed before, um, and just make it all go away. Or at the very least, what I can do is take those cases and put them in a position where the people can move forward. So if they have, let's say, a uh, outstanding fines and costs from an OVI case, a drunk driving case, those are mandatory fines. I'm not allowed to suspend them, but I can release the blocks and give them a long time, like a year to pay. I can do that. Um, if let's say um, one of the cases that's challenging for us is let's say somebody goes to prison for a burglary involving um, a former spouse or former live-in girlfriend, an intimate partner. Uh, there's still children together. And when they come out, there's still a pending domestic violence case or a probation that was never completed from a prior domestic violence case involving the same victim. Uh, that's not a case that we're just going to make go away. But we can do something to put that person in a position where they can continue to move forward. So we might uh, be able to continue the probation, make sure that as a part of their parole or other requirements that they're getting the batter's intervention program done, or make sure that they have the, the opportunity to continue on probation to complete all of the required terms of probation. But the point is that they have all of that mess that they've spent a lifetime creating that they have now resolved to move beyond, we can have that all in one place at one time and set it up in such a way that the person has the ability to move forward. We're always very sensitive about coordinating with parole so we know what, the, what requirements parole is putting on a person. Uh, we're not going to require somebody to go to batter's intervention while they're trying to do 50 hours worth of stuff every week at the Volunteers of America at their halfway house that they've been released to. Uh, and then people like Mike Hampton can talk about that because he's been there. He can say, look, judge, that's just not reasonable. We can't get that done within the next three months or six months. We really have to push that out beyond that time. So we can, we, we have a lot of different people in that process to, to, to make that work. So as a very practical matter, people get hooked up with volunteers with the reentry coalition. We don't care who those volunteers are. Uh, it can be a mentor, it can be Lutheran Social Services, it can be some uh, mental health group. Then through our first Wednesday program, those volunteers and the person they're trying to help get coordinated with the uh, volunteer attorneys who get them on our reentry docket on the third Thursday of the month. Um, at on, on the first Wednesday, Tom gives that list of cases to our clerk's office. We have a dedicated person in our clerk's office whose responsibility is to collect all those cases. And then we have sometimes a stack of cases. Make sure you can see this on screen. Where's my hand? Well, you can't see it because it's not big enough. Sometimes that stack of cases is bigger than I can show on my screen. I'll go back here. It's huge. Um, they'll come in with a huge stack of cases and a huge amount of optimism. And it's nearly impossible to have any optimism when you're looking at that great big stack of cases. It's not possible unless I step in and help them do something with that stack of cases. And that's what we do. 
And so we get rid of what we can, we put the rest of it in a manageable situation. And uh, Mike can tell you what the person looks like or sounds like when they walk out the door. Um, and I'll ask you to do that. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time when it's done about those kind of technical aspects about how we do it within the court system. But it helped us that we have uh, Tom Lukey, who's coordinating volunteer attorneys in a place where all of the other service providers are at the same time. Um, so that everybody who's with reentry gets funneled to the volunteer attorneys then Tom is the person who's responsible for taking that list of people and getting it to the clerk's office. And then we have a dedicated person at the clerk's office who's responsible for getting all of those files for all of those people onto my docket on the third Thursday of the month. And then all of the mentors who are helping those specific people are there on that third Thursday of the month with the volunteers attorneys and with me. So with that, I'm going to introduce Mike Hampton. Um, he was asked earlier, are you a peer mentor? And I've heard uh, other people ask Mike, who do you work with? Who do you work for? What's your program? Uh, and Mike's response to that is, I'm just Mike. And that's what he is. He is just Mike. He is somebody with a wealth of personal, uh, we call it now lived experience. Uh, he went through re-entry. Um, and so he knows how it works. He worked hard doing it. And he's really made an effort to understand the system and also understand what he doesn't know about the system and where he has to reach out and who he has to reach out to. So, Mike, if you'll go ahead and uh, kind of introduce yourself, give you a little of your story, and then tell how it works from your perspective. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Hampton, and uh, I was convicted in 2006. Uh, got out in 2008. I had to go to halfway house and I got involved with the reentry. Uh, first, I was reluctant going in there, but uh, once I opened my mind and my eyes, reentry was my calling, I guess. They say you you make your own opportunity. So, reentry was my opportunity. Uh, they really gave me direction, they gave me stability, and uh, I found something I can uh, believe in. And what I learned coming out of prison is the lack of trust. You hear all these words, I'm gonna help you do this, I'm gonna help you do that. Then when you get out, you go see these agents, uh, programs and they let you down. So that's the rejection. And my thought was, if I ever had a chance to um, really work hard and help somebody, cause I definitely believe in second chances cause I have one that I'm gonna do my part to help build confidence in young men and women. So right now I'm the most reliable person, you know, they can talk to. They feel comfortable with me. I, I got their trust, I got their respect, and they see the shoes I walked in. So it's a lot easier communicating with them when you walked in the same shoes. Then I help them get results, you know, help them move on in life. So. I mean, when you come out of prison, you got 999 problems. Well, I only try to solve one, and it's called driver's license. I mean, like Tom said, I was one of the first five when they started the re-entry docket to get my court costs and fines waived. So from there, I did motivated speaking about the re-entry, all the productive things I went through about the re-entry, housing, everything. And uh, it's my way of giving back. I mean, you can't put a price on success when a person accomplished something, the spark on their eyes, you, you can't, that's priceless. So I'm changing lives out here, closing cases and helping them move forward. Uh, they relate to me, I'm easy to find, I'm in the community. And they look at me like I'm a blessing cause I don't charge nothing. I want you to be successful. So that's how Mike Hampton's story begins. So Mike, um, answer this question. So let's say you're walking down Door Street in Toledo and uh, people know who you are now and some guy walks up to you, he's not been out of prison long and he doesn't have a driver's license. He says, Mike, will you help me get your, my driver's license? What's the next, what do you do? Uh, first, I just get his information, his birthday, social security, number and uh, come to court. Well, his file, well, not his file, but uh, recidivist. his record. And, you know, 
tell them to meet me at court. And we come to court and it's, it's easy to talk about, you know, it's hard to believe that he a stranger is off the street, say, I'm gonna help you get your license. First thing they say, how much you gonna charge me? Nothing, just be there. I, all I need is your time. So afterwards, when we go to court and they see the results, I just got a good friend. I got a best friend right now. Now they believe in something. So I don't try to stand wrong. They look at me like, well, if you can do this, why not me? And that's why I tell them, why not you? Why you can't do this? Just some hard work. You got to believe in something and, and you got to believe in the people you're dealing with. So I got a good rapport out here in the community, all sides of town. Um, my face is the easiest face to find because I'm in the neighborhoods with them. They see me in the stores, they see me out. And uh, they shock me because I be in the grocery store and they get the day is right there and they stand me. But <laughs> they just want their parents to see the man that helped them. And then they mother or their father come up and say, this is how you changed my child's life. This is what he's doing positive. So that's my reward right there. Keep doing what you're doing. So, I mean, like I said, you got to believe in somebody. You got to trust somebody. And right now, I got a lot of people trusting in Mike Hampton and little things I do. So one of the things that Mike has done that I, I think is important is um, he doesn't just meet somebody and say, OK, let's run off to court and beg the judge to clear the record or suspend fines and costs. Uh, he asks the person to start taking steps uh, one step at a time. Take this step, um, make some payments, um, go to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, get your uh, get your insurance start making uh, payments toward the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. And then when Mike does show up in court with somebody and he might just go directly to the duties judge, that's what he was talking about when he was um, saying, meet me in court. Uh, he can get that person um, in front of the duties judge uh, or um, take them to the first Wednesday program and then get on the re-entry docket. But when, um, when Mike, actually get somebody in front of the judge, they already have a story to tell. And the story is these are the steps that we've taken to get to the point where we think it's appropriate. And he doesn't put it in these words on the record, but that's what happens where we think it's appropriate to ask the judge for a little bit of a break here now. And so th things have happened. Um, there's a, a record of having changed with no new charges. And um, Mike can establish credibility both for the person he's working with and, um, and maintain that credibility for himself. Now we have in Toledo, we have seven Toledo Municipal Court judge, judges, 10 common pleas judges, and then three suburban courts, each with their own single judge. And Mike has established um, with some help from me, some help from Tom and others in the reentry coalition, uh, established relationships with all those judges. Uh, and we have other people in town who are working as mentors who've done that also. So these judges know that when somebody from reentry walks in with a person, they know that person has already started a long process of working toward getting their driver's license, getting stable housing, addressing uh, mental health or drug and alcohol issues, uh, working toward employment. So the judges have a great amount of trust. And it's no guarantee. We all know that but have a great amount of trust in the re-entry coalition mentors who are walking into court with people. And so judges are willing, judges across our county are willing to be a lot more aggressive with people working with the re-entry coalition because that means something. And people from re-entry aren't just running into court and saying, hey, suspend my fines and costs or make this case go away or whatever. They're making sure that people are making appropriate steps and it has really developed a lot of trust. So as an example, Mike was telling me earlier that he um, sat down with the judge in uh, uh, one of our suburban courts, um, and the only complaint the judge had was Mike was wearing the wrong baseball cap. So Mike was wearing a uh, Boston, Red Sox. Boston Red Sox hat, which I think everybody can get, then guess who the, uh, the judge was a fan of. So Mike's going to wear pinstripes the next time he goes into that courtroom, but other than that, the judge knows, he knows there's no guarantee and this person might eventually mess up and, you know, something will have to happen. But he knows that when that person works in with Mike Hampton, that a lot of work has already been done to put the person in a position where he's likely to be successful. And then as judges, that's what 
we, we have to be concerned about public safety, recidivism. And once we know that that work has been done and this person's ready for a break, we want to give that break. And, and we do. So I think with that, we've used up. Did you want to add anything else? We're about at our 20 minutes, Mike. Well, I, I just try to make these guys, uh, you know, they got to prove they self worthy or something. I mean, you know, you're changing your life. So, I mean, you got to take these right steps. And like I say, me taking them to court and they seeing how these judges um, show me respect because I, I earned this hard work. But I'm telling them, you know, you can do the same thing. I mean, all it costs a little change. That's all it takes. So, like I say, I'm no better than nobody else. I'm just a guy with a heart that love giving. So that's the Mike Hampton story. So the, the last thing that I want to point out for anybody who would kind of like to copy what we're doing, first of all, um, we'd be happy to take any, uh, you know, questions, email me, whatever. Um, but Mike and I have had a lot of conversations about the unauthorized practice of law. Mike and anybody else who's operating as a mentor, who's walking people into court, do not want to be representing people in court. And now that Mike knows a lot of judges, um, you, you can get into that uh, area where you're engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. And so you want to be careful about that. So what Mike does is he has people speak for themselves in court instead of speaking for them. And most of the people you're working with are entitled to a public defender. We have a very robust public defender program in Toledo Lucas County. And so Mike can always uh, pass the person off to the public defender. And he knows those guys also, those men and women, and he can pass them off. So we want to, as a court, make sure that we're following our rules and superintendents and our own local rules when we're doing a reentry docket. And mentors like Mike want to uh, make sure that they're not engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. So just so Mike and I have that conversation. He knows uh, where those lines are, and we're careful about that. Thank you, Judge Coleman. Thank you, Mike, for all your uh, hard work that you do. Oh, sorry. We are next going to uh, transition to Cuyahoga Common Pleas Judge uh, Russo, and I'll allow her to make uh, some corrections to my earlier statement. And I do apologize, Judge, but uh, it's, it's your stage now. And please feel free to introduce your uh, guest as well. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting us. With me is Jovan Norton. I'm going to give you an over overview of our ranch court. And then uh, Jovan, who's a graduate, I thought it might be helpful for you to hear from him about his experience. So our reentry court was the first judicial release reentry court in the state. We started almost 14 years ago. We had to create it from basically nothing. We have uh, saved the state on average a million and a half dollars per year, which we calculate only on the prison per diem rate. We do not include the money saved for uh, medical. We don't include the money that goes back into the community because our people are working and staying with their families and helping. So it's a very conservative measure. We follow our graduates for three years upon graduation. We have a 93% success rate with only a 7% recidivism rate over that three year period that we're watching. That includes you know, not getting misdemeanor cases. So it's a very significant number. The um, court, we deal with felonies. We take every felony that's eligible for judicial release in the state, including people who've had gun specifications, violent crimes, the only uh, case that we don't take is we do not take contact sex offenses. It's a variety of reasons for that. One is it's a very specialized supervision that I don't want to mix into reentry court. And it's also, we do group events together. And so I don't want anybody on either side to be uncomfortable. So other than that, we take any possible case and we have had manslaughter cases. We have had felonious assaults with guns. We have had aggravated robberies with guns. We have bank robberies with guns. We've taken people who in the past would have never been given a chance and put them into ranch court. We are also not a first offense court. You can have as many as six prior prison terms and still be eligible for this court. Our criteria is all on our website if you'd like to read it. We do a what we call a packet of review. We can accept people either by motion or by application. The applications are in each prison the application is a way for someone to test the water, so to speak, and not uh, file a motion if they don't wish. If we accept someone with an application or a pro se motion, 
and their judge transfers them, then we assign them an attorney. So nobody has to spend any money to get into our court. We have 34 judges here. The judges have the individual option to opt in or opt out, 32 opt in. That means that every day, every judicial release motion filed, whether it's pro se or by a lawyer, is reviewed by me and my team. And we do an individual packet on each of those people. If they pass basic eligibility, then the packet is sent to me for initial review. If I feel the person is a good candidate for rancher court, then I will do an interview. It's either a video interview. Occasionally I have to do phone interviews because of Zoom availability during the pandemic, but primarily we do video interviews. If after the interview, I think the person's a good candidate, then I contact their sentencing judge and I tell them what I've found that I'd like to take them into rancher court. If they agree, they transfer jurisdiction to me. I take over the case, I hold the hearing. It remains an adversarial hearing. The prosecutors have every right to come in and object. They have every right to appeal me if I make a decision that they don't like. So why am I not a certified Supreme Court docket? Well, I decided since we were the first ones and we created this from nothing, that we really knew what we were doing. And the most important thing about what we were doing was discretion of a judge. I feel very strongly that judges need to maintain and protect their judicial discretion. And so we, we created the program so that I had discretion on who I thought would be a good candidate and the individual sensing judge decided ultimately whether or not the person came in. If a sensing judge says no, that they don't wanna transfer them, I don't advocate in any way. I just send the information on to the judge. And if they wanna grant them general judicial release, then they can do that. We do have a specialized form of supervision. It's too much to go into in the short period of time we have, but I'm happy to have anyone contact me and we'll share it. I have one probation officer. She's dedicated entirely to ranch report. We have one processor. So I have a staff of only four people, me, my bailiff, my processor, and my PO. And I think our statistics really bear out the fact that this is a very cost-effective means of creating success for people. It doesn't cost counties a lot of money, but it saves a lot of money. The only thing I would say is that we really don't get any money from the state. All we're doing is really using county money. I would like to see more support of reentry courts generally, whether they're certified or not from ODRC, because we really are saving some money and we're stopping people from going back into prison. They also in my program can be in prison on two cases at the same time, but not three. That's one of the eligibility requirements. And everybody has some things they have to do the same. Everybody has to work or do work service immediately upon release. And I've always been proud of the people in this program. They're always working. They work real fast. They get jobs. They're motivated. They do phenomenally well. Everybody has to do psychological counseling. That's one of the conditions that we have in our program. And that actually comes from us talking to people in the program. I think the reason we're so successful and the other reason I really didn't want to be involved as being a certified docket is that I take a lot of my direction from the people in the program. We really uh, ebb and flow and change and amend and modify what we're doing based on the feedback we get from the people in our program. They're the best consultants I have to teach us what we need to do to help them. And they are as responsible for this program being as successful as my team is. So that's basically what we do. I know it's a lot of information. It's uh, too much really to, you know, to get into the nitty gritty, but as I said, we're available to you. I think the most important part of this today is for you to hear from Jovan because Jovan has a life experience. I met him when I was teaching in the prison. I teach a class in the prisons. And I think I denied you three times. Yeah, probably more than that. Probably more than that. <laughs> but I'll stay and persistent though. He yeah. is persistent. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, through the course of the class, able to talk to people and have one-on-ones with them. And I also do seminars in the prison. That helps me identify people. Jovan came into the program. He's already graduated. It feels like it was yesterday that he came in the program, but he's already been out for a while and doing great. So I really want you to hear from him because he's, he is like all my graduates. I tell them they're the ambassadors, not only of our program, but they're the ambassadors into the public of why people should hire somebody with a record, why you shouldn't prejudge somebody. We talk a lot about, you know, being honest about what your past is, but that that doesn't define you. It's a part of your journey. It's not your journey. 
it's a maybe a detour or it might actually be an opportunity for some people going to prison is what gets them back on track or maybe gets them focused on their education so it's not always a bad thing many times it turns out to be the stepping stone of something great i have one graduate who i had sent, i personally had sentenced for a bank robbery i let him out after i think uh 10 years he went through the program was successful and he now has contracts uh, and he's had contracts with ODRC and he has contracts with other providers providing reentry services in his own 501c3 that he developed. So I think it's really important that we listen to the people who have been in the criminal justice system. And if we're really going to talk about reform, that discussion shouldn't be had without involving those people in the discussion, because that's an important piece of anything we talk about as far as improving the system. So Javon, I send it to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon, you all. Uh, I'm honored to be here today, especially at this capacity. I wish the guys can see me now. I never thought I'd be sitting on this side <laughs> of the bench, you know, sitting next to a judge um, speaking on behalf of a program like this is surely is an honor for me. Um, I did five and a half years in prison. I recently was released uh, December 2019, thanks to uh, Judge Russo and um, the reentry court. And I'm, you know, I'm humbled and, you know, grateful that I was chosen to be into the program. I was sentenced to aggravated robbery and kidnapping, um, two counts and the weapons on a disability. I went into prison uh, kind of bitter because of the situation I was in, but that's another story. I had to make a choice to, uh, to, to to lay in my bitterness or do things to better myself, no matter what I know what the circumstances were. Um, when you get information flowing through the prisons, you know, the packets come around by reentry court, um, this uh, judicial release that, and I'm thinking, well, if these appeals don't go through, what's my next course of action to take to try to get back home to my family? And, uh, you know, the reentry court packet came across and a lot of a lot of guys, a lot of jailhouse lawyers would tell you, um, oh, no, you're not going to get in that program, especially with no aggravated robbery, especially with no kidnapping. But of course, I didn't let that detour me. I knew that once I read that packet and, and, and saw what the criteria was to get into the program, I said, well, let me walk these steps over these years that I got to do until my mandatory time is up. And I did that. I, I educated myself. I uh, took a, apprenticeship programs. I attended Ashland University and I took every inmate led program and staff led program um, that I could take to give myself the best opportunity possible to uh, get back home as soon as possible. Um, a lot of guys in prison see that and say, oh man, I'm not about to go through all that. I'm just going to do the time. Well, that's your choice. I made the choice to do right in prison, um, become a better man for myself and for my children, for my family. And, and uh, you know, that's how I got here today. And again, I'm grateful for that. I was denied the program once my mandatory time was up. I did three years and then I had to wait the six months to uh, file. And yes, I did get denied uh, for reentry court. Then I got denied. Um, by my sentencing judge several times, but I continue to uh, stay focused on the things that I wanted to do. And uh, reentry court was uh, denying me like seven times, I think. Seven? I, I think it was seven times, but I, I stayed to it. <laughs> Maybe with some repetitiveness in there, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I, I continue just to do the right things, though, and continue to educate myself and remain positive. Um, I mentor guys in there, but, you know, I like I like to walk the walk other than talk the talk. So when when guys see me in my bunk area or guys see me in the child hall or on a, on a, on a yard, on a basketball court, they go see a, a, a light full of positivity, a, a person they can come to. Um, that's going to help them out and give them real advice because I am from from the streets and I've been involved in the streets all my life up until the time I went to prison in some way, shape or form. And a lot of guys knew me from that, but 
But when they see me trying to uh, do the right things, it rubbed off of some guys. And I, you know, I took pride in that and made a conscious decision to, to walk righteous every day while I was in there. And I, and I continuously do that now. And, and, and one of the main reasons um, that I do is because of reentry court to keep me focused. Anytime I feel like I'm about to backslide, um, I can think about the opportunity that Judge Russo gave me. Um, I can think about her staff that gave me all the support that I needed once I re-entered society. Um, they, they show, all, everybody on their staff showed the same passion that she showed to us. And that was important. That's very important when the whole staff showing love and, and giving you the resources that you need to succeed. You know, that, that, that was very helpful. I did have a home to come to when I came home. I, I had a lot of things that, that the brother was speaking about. You know, people uh, ask you and tell you uh, the things that you need, but you need the resources and you need the people in your corner to, to, to direct you to the resources and to the right people. Uh, and and reentry court did that for me. Um, like, like your honor said, she, I got transferred from one prison to uh, Grafton reintegration to where uh, I was able to see Judge Russo on a continuous basis every other week for the RISE program. And that was a program to where, once again, um, it was as if she wasn't a judge, it was as if she was an auntie, a mother, a sister type figure in that class because we, it, we got very emotional in them, in them classes and we was able to speak our truth without being judged. And it got to the point like, wow, this is not the uh, Judge Russo, the Nancy Russo that I heard of all these years. You know, she she's awesome. She's loving, caring, and and she she let us she 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 allowed us to know that um, my inmate number was six six one zero six five. No, that's not who you are. You are not an inmate. You are a man that made a mistake or didn't. You just you in the situation, and I'm here to possibly uh, see through all that that other you know people don't see and she just it, it's a it was a program uh by the name of kairos that i was involved with it was a prison ministry and them guys and, and and females came in and they they was uh very genuine and the feel that i got for them people is the same thing i got from judge russo and her staff when they came and it was the same same as now and that that and that that connection is very important to me during the pandemic last year, when you get a phone call from the judge to check on you and your family, uh, how we doing, that, that's important. And when you got somebody like that that's rooting for you and caring about you, that, that keep you on, the, on the, uh, the mind state of continuously wanting to do the right thing. If you about to pick up that hot pan, you're not gonna pick it up because you know what? You is uh, trying to set an example and keep setting an example for the program, be an example of the program because of uh, the opportunity that Judge Russo, you know, gave. And I, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And the support is always there, the resources, and we always can come back. And, and anytime that Judge Russo need me and need me to come speak on behalf of the program, I'm gonna always be honored to do that because it's, uh, it, it's keeping me productive and it's keeping people that's watching me productive. And like I said, when when I when I go back and some of them guys call from prison and I answer their calls, I'll be like, guess who I was? I was in the courtroom today behind that bench with the judge talking to some individuals that 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 you know want to hear what's going on with us and where our mind, where our mind frame is at. So well, right now I'm working, I'm working in an apprenticeship with a plumbing company so you know something i wish i started a long time ago that's great money in there but <laughs> but that's, that's just that's just something in the meantime and and like the judge say we got out and, and they made sure y'all get to work no matter what it is put your pride to the side because whatever your dreams and goals is they go come but you gotta stay productive and that's that's what i'm doing i'm, I'm working a job that i didn't never have interest in but i'm gaining interest and i'm learning new skills and that and that's through the motivation of of, of Siobhan. That's that's uh the PO that's on on the reentry staff that will continuously make sure you're looking. Don't slack off. 
find that job, find that job. Or you want to go to community service for free. I'd rather find a job. But that's just one thing. Um, I'm working with some nonprofits, uh, nonprofit organizations trying to help the youth. One is called Strong Arms United. Um, we, we're trying to uh, detour some of the guys with job opportunities and some mentorship um, in the community through uh, lawn care and it, in, a, in a fall time, maybe some painting. So we're trying to gain some grounds with that. Um, one of the criteria for the guys to get the job once we get this thing, thing rolling is come to a, a meeting every Friday to talk about their problems and, and differences, or whatever issues they got, and anything that we can help them with, you know, clothing, transportation, housing, anything, any resources we we got, we go help the next person that 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 really wants to help. It's a lot of guys that try to play the system, but by me doing prison time and, and some of the guys that do time, we all walks of life we walk we we cross paths with, so we can read through a lot of bull crap. And, and we definitely do, you know what I'm saying? So we, like like your honor, she have to pick and choose on, you know, this is a good candidate, but this is the best candidate for this program. We got to keep that keep that uh, percentage high, that 93% success rate that, you know, I look, that's, 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 that's an honor to be a part of that. And I don't want to do nothing to keep it down. And I want to help other guys have that type of mentality about, you know, just doing the right thing and, and um, standing for something and standing for what's right. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, jo <laughs> Thank you Judge Russo. Uh, thanks for that great information. And Jovan and Mike Hampton, got to tell you, you guys are the glue that hold, hold these courts together and make them so successful. I appreciate all that, uh, Jovan and, and Mike, that you do for these courts. I, I'm going to turn it over now to Diane Bricker, our secretary for the Ohio Association of Local Reentry Coalitions, for questions. Um, I also want to recognize two other officers who are online. Kisten Palmore is on. She's our immediate uh, past president, as well as our current treasurer. And Jamie G is on. She's our vice president. Um, and if anybody wants information on the Ohio Association of Local Reentry Coalitions, my email is in the chat. Please send me um, uh, your email and tell me to put you on the mailing list, and we will. Diane, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Judge Russo, Judge Coleman, and Mike and Jovan. Those are, it's great what you're doing and, and being mentors and everything. Um, that was the question was, how does one become a mentor? And I think it was answered by, um, I think you, the person said that you can register to become a certified peer through the Mental Health Association, if I'm not correct someone let me know, but, um, and that was the only question that I saw. Um, let me know yeah. if anybody else has any questions. Diane, I would say uh, OMAS does have a certification process that okay. makes, makes it Medicaid uh, billable. Uh, Mike's, okay. not, Mike's not a certified through the OMAS. Um, I think most of our mentors are just uh, passionate about what they do and, and they've lived, lived the experience and, and they know how to remove barriers. Great, great. That was the only question that I see. So, um, you know, write in the chat box if you have any questions for Judge Coleman, Judge Russo, Mike, or Jovan. Judge Coleman, how many uh, individuals do you think we have served over the 10 plus years we've been doing the docket? Um, well, I mean, I'll just do some quick math here, but we, um, before coronavirus, we were doing at least uh, 15 a week times 52 weeks. And uh, we've been doing it for, so that's 7,800. It's a lot of people. So, uh, you know, in response to that, um, how to be a mentor, you know, Mike just walks down Door Street or stops at Smith Park and says, how are you guys doing? And he's helped enough people that now people are saying, uh, hey, I mean, they recognize him. They say, will you help me? So there wasn't anything, um, I was going to say special or magical, but uh, I mean, there really was something special or magical about what Mike does. But it wasn't like, you know, I took some test and got certified with some government organization. He just did it 
Um, he went through reentry. He paid attention. He did it right. Um, he started living his life in a way that he wanted to and liked. And he said, I can share this with other people. And so when he was on Door Street, he started sharing it with other people. And that's all he did. And the more he shared, the more people figured out that he had something to do. Uh, I met him um, and we got to um, we just um, got to know each other because we have this reentry coalition that's very collaborative. And I want to know as a judge, what can I do to help people? And I know that Mike knows people. And so I say, what can we do? And we just start talking. And then I, you know, every time I, opportunity I have, I introduce him to other judges. And, and that's a, a huge part of it is just the networking piece. I give you a perfect example. Um, I was honored to get a, uh, a community service award from our bar association that was given to me right before coronavirus at our um, at our uh, bar association Christmas lunch, which is one of our biggest events. So I invited Mike to go with me. And when I had the chance to talk, I had Mike stand up and I said, I want every judge in the room to look at Mike and know who he is and know that when he walks in your courtroom, that means somebody's working with reentry. And I want you to know what that means. So and, 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 you know, he, Mike learned to introduce himself to our public defenders. So he can't represent people, but he can introduce people to the public defender. They can get appointed. Um, so a lot of us just, just go out and do it. If you know something about how to help somebody, reach out and help them. People will figure it out. Yeah. Uh, you want to add anything, Mike? Wait. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Divine. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, bro. To understand the shoes, you got to walk in them. And what you're doing with that judge, I feel you sitting next to the judge because uh, you know how it was before. We weren't sitting with the judge, we stand in front of him. But seeing you sit next to the judge, like I'm sitting next to Judge Coleman, that's a feeling you can't, uh, that's just an outstanding feeling. Yes. Keep working hard, bro. Thank you. I also want to add, I didn't say the statistic, and I know that we do need to keep statistics and measures about what we're doing to show that it works and encourage others. For me, the best statistic, other than our success rate, is that we've saved almost 600 years in prison. And that is a phenomenal number when you think about it, because every year of that has a person behind it. And that's a big deal to me, that 600 years, you know, almost a century, I'm sorry, six centuries, almost a millennia so far of time served in prison. And that, that's important. And I appreciate that Jovan, like the others, are ambassadors. And that's important too, as I said earlier, when Jovan goes into the community and he interacts with people, he's teaching people that your past should not be held against you. And he's teaching people that everybody has something to offer. And he's doing it through the strength of a very negative experience that he came out of very positive. And that's how we're going to change people's attitudes about people with felony records. It's about letting people who have a felony record not live in shame their whole lives because that's the debt they paid to society. They paid it and now it's time to move forward. And they have a lot to give to all of us. And I, I appreciate that all of my Rancher Court graduates are out there. And even the people who don't get into Rancher Court, the people I meet in prison who aren't eligible for some reason, it's one of the reasons that I teach the class is because I want them to leave prison proud. And I want them to be proud of themselves, accept the mistake, but that's, that's not who you are. It's very important that we start communicating that to people who had you know a run-in with the law or something's gone wrong in their lives. And it's also important that we look behind what caused that behavior so that we can help them turn it around and not fall into that coping mechanism. Many times crime becomes a coping mechanism. And we have to listen, as I said, we have to listen. True reform requires that we listen to the people that have been there. So we thank have a, you again. Yeah, great. Thank you, Judge Russo. We have a couple more questions here. Um, one of them is, how does an inmate begin the process of getting to reentry court if they are denied parole? Well, parole is very different. If somebody's on an old law case, then they have to apply for parole through the parole board and no county court, 
no court has jurisdiction over that person. Anybody sentenced after 1996, other than something like a murder case where you have parole board involved, that's judicial release. So they have to wait until the statutory period until which they're eligible. And then for my court, they can apply pro se by filing a motion. They can apply through our application, which as I said earlier, is in every prison and is also available on our website, or they can have a lawyer file it. So we have a number of ways for people to access the program. And uh, the application is not a pleading. It's not filed on the docket. It's not public. It has a lot of personal information in it. Mm -hmm. So it's also a way for the person to like I said, test the waters because the state doesn't have to respond to the application. It's a way for us to take a look at the person. It's like a no risk for them. There's nothing put on the docket. Uh, the one thing I do spend a lot of time looking at, and Javon can attest to this because I say it every time I speak, is your institutional summary. If I find that mm -hmm. you, you are being a problem with the guards, if I find that you are lazy, that you're not going to class, that you're fighting, that you're making hooch, you're doing all those things, you're not going to come in my program. And I'm very clear about that because I'm very protective of the program and I'm very protective of the people in the program. And you're going to have to demonstrate through your incarceration how you do under supervision. It's not to say you can't have any write-ups because I also understand each prison might write you up separately as far as what, what becomes an incident. Women are written up differently than men. You know, I, I know I've learned this as I'm in the prisons. So I take that into account. And I also tell the inmates that uh, are applying, I say, look, going into prison is traumatic, coming out of prison is traumatic. So I understand there might be some bumps at the beginning, but if you're a problem child, you're not going to come into my program. So I hope that that helps motivate people to stay out of trouble because mm -hmm. it's good for them and it's good for their opportunities to come into the program. And it's they should be respectful of ODRC. I think that that's a very important thing and, and I want them respectful of ODRC. Great, thank you, Judge Russo. Do the peer mentors serving the courts ever gather for training or provide the courts insight and networking? Uh, I would say that, I, I don't know that we've ever done something that sounds like a question of, is there some formality that we do? And I would say the answer is no, um, but we, we get together a lot. Uh, so every, um, ev every um, re-entry docket I have, which is once a month, all of a bunch of different mentors are in my courtroom. Tom Lutke's there, uh, volunteer mentors. And at the very least, once all the cases are done, we have to get together to make sure that we get the next one scheduled. And it has to fit in with my court schedule. So it's usually the third Thursday. Every now and then we have to move it a little bit. A couple of times we've had to pick another judge to do it because I wasn't available. And there's other scheduling issues to talk about with the clerk's office being having enough time to collect all those cases. So there are um, practical issues we have to talk about. But that's also an opportunity for us to have a larger discussion about how can we expand, how can we introduce um, this program to other local judges, and, and we do those sorts of things kind of informally or organically. I mean, we, we one time um, called the Me judge and met at a restaurant between the two of us, and I think, Mike, you were there, Tom, Tom was, there. was there. And we, I, I just called up the mom me judge and say, hey, there's some people from reentry who'd like to meet you and tell you what they do. And, and um, he was a pretty new judge, so nobody knew how he would take that. He was enthusiastic, extremely enthusiastic. And his eyes, uh, somebody um, just mentioned about their son in Texas and said, I hope that's going on. Well, that was Judge, um, judge Hazard's response was, I can't believe this is going on. This is fantastic. I want it in my court. And that's just kind of how we did it. Person to person, networking. And then once you have some successes, they grow. When, when we started this 10, 13 years ago with the reentry docket part of it, um, none of the judges were actively participating in reentry, I don't think. And now all of the judges are at least familiar with it and open to it. So it's a lot of networking. Great. 
Thank you, Judge Coleman. One last question, and I know we're running a little bit late, but we'll try and get this answered. Um, the, the company, this is um, the company that this person works for is 180 Demo, and as well as their sister company, Clean Turn, and they have missions focused around providing opportunities and changing perceptions, especially people in the reentry or addiction recovery spaces. Any thoughts on how we might best connect with people in reentry courts who could benefit from having a job offer lined up? And they're located in Columbus. I don't know if they have a reentry coalition, but I would tell anybody in Toledo, get hooked up with our local reentry coalition. Perfect. Thank you. And Judge Russo, were you going to say something? I would say that if they have an interest in that, that they could certainly contact me and I'd be happy to give them some direction. And also, you know, we have graduates who move and okay. that they could make contact with that might be able to help them. Great. I appreciate that. Well, thank you all for attending and there are no more questions, but um, I don't know if anybody wants to have any final thoughts or. I, I, I'll, I'll say one thing. I, I did see a couple questions I think we might have missed, but what we'll do is okay. we're recording this. We will send those questions to the appropriate judge uh, with your contact information and, and get an answer out to you. I just wanted to thank people for joining today. It's a uh, national reentry week. Uh, we're having a lot of different programs that we're offering all around the state. We have some great partners from the state on this call. I just wanna thank again, the um, our partners, uh, the Office of Reentry at ODRC. I saw Ronnie Burks and Daryl Graves both on. Thank you for all you do for Ohio. And also the West Conference of the Ohio Methodist Church. They've been a godsend to reentry. And um, Reba, I don't know if you have any final parting thoughts. Reba, Re Re you're on mute. <laughs> I will, all I would say is thank you all and thank you um, to our presenters and to our facilitators for making this just a rich session and so hopefully you've been inspired by it hopefully you have um, or your wheels are turning about maybe how if you don't have a reentry court or a reentry court docket or anything dealing with reentry courts uh, at, at your level locally that uh, that you maybe start to think about how you can initiate something based on our discussion today. I will be sending out a follow-up email to each one of you who has participated with a link to this session. You can then download it, share it, whatever you, you need to do to, to continue to get the word out that this is one way we can interrupt, right? Interrupt that continued cycle of recidivism. And so, and it's very transformative as we've heard from Mr. Hampton and Mr. Norton today. So thank you all for joining and uh, look for that follow-up email. It'll be coming through um, all in community, all in community at wocumc.org. And like uh, Tom said, we'll send any questions that were in the chat, you know, kind of late uh, to the judges or to our, our facilitators to make sure that those get answered for you. So thank you. Have a blessed day and happy, I guess, happy National Reentry Week because you all are making a difference. And just thank know you. that and go in thank peace. You. And enjoy thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time and very informative. And, uh, you. and you guys all do great work. And to the two guys that spoke, congratulations and keep up the great work because, uh, um, your example sets an example for others, and 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 uh, and so yeah. Yep. Thank you. With all you in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.